Happy Friday. Welcome to Browns Week. Patriots 2 and 3 headed back on the road to take on 2 and 3 Cleveland. As of now, as we record on Thursday night, it looks like Bailey Zappi. The fever is still going to continue. Of course, things could change over the weekend, but this is where we're at. Now, for Browns Week, we're going to pivot from the traditional format where I have a guest on. We break the game down. We spend sometimes upwards of an hour, even when it's a Lions. Thank you, Fitzy, talking about the game. I'm going to introduce and run down the Browns here give you three matchups of our traditional three, two, one. Then we're going to take a break and we're going to do an interview with Ty Dunn, the author of the upcoming book, the blood and guts, how tight ends say football, because this book is coming out next week and you are going to want to buy this book. It is loaded with notes about, of course, Gronk, also Ben Coates and Bill Belichick, even in chapters where Gronk and Ben Coates don't even appear. So Ty came on. We had a great conversation. He is the founder of his own site, Go Long. Does a lot of long-form storytelling about the NFL and football. I think you're probably going to have a moment, too, as we get talking, or maybe if you look him up, we remember and go, oh, yeah, that guy. Because he did a number of huge stories that that blew up. And uh, Bleacher Report was his last stop before he started Go Long. You know, sitting down with Sammy Watkins, what he believes, and all of this kind of crazy uh, as I saw it, you know, big picture galaxy brain kind of thinking, but makes you pause and think because Sammy was incredibly open with him and Ty has a gift for getting athletes to open up. There was one about Mike McCarthy's falling out in Green Bay, his riff with Aaron Rodgers, McCarthy being a little bit lazy before that. He covered the Packers, he covered the Bills, and now he's doing his own thing and has his own book. So we get into all of that, plus all of the Bill Belichick stories, Gronk and Ben Coates, and then a little, little bit on the Browns. Uh, and Patriots at the end. So we'll save the two keys and one extra point with Ty. For now, the Browns, as I mentioned, two and three, which run down their vitals. They are 12th by DVOA overall as a team, fourth in offense, 30th in defense. We'll get back to that in a second. 21st on special teams. They have beaten the Steelers and Panthers. They have lost close games all by one score to the Jets, Falcons, and last week against the Chargers. So the things to know about the Browns honestly are not unlike what Bill Belichick told us on Wednesday. And he, you know, he's running down the whole team, giving out bouquets left and right, blah, blah, blah. But Nick Chubb is the name to know. And you know this, of course, if you play fantasy, if you have just glanced at red zone once in the last four years, Nick Chubb very well might be the best running back in the NFL. What he is definitely is fortunate to run behind the best run blocking line in the NFL, which held up last year and has continued right now, according to Pro Football Focus in Cleveland with elite talent across that front. A lot of first rounders that frankly didn't show up like first rounders when the Patriots had them here last year and went 45 to seven. The first drive, they mowed the Patriots down. But after that, it was just an ass kicking. Now, as for Chubb, 593 yards in five games, four of them 100 yard performances. He has forced... This is my favorite stat of the whole pod. 42 missed tackles in five games. Think about that. He has averaged over eight broken tackles or slipped or dodged or whatever per game this season. This guy is in his prime and certainly headed to Pro Bowl, perhaps all pro more than that. So even when the line isn't doing doing its job, Nick Chubb is making yards and creating problems. Um, Jacoby Brissett, quarterback under center, you remember him, 64% completion percentage. 212 yards per game, five touchdowns, three interceptions. It looks like the Jacoby Brissett stat line. Now, out wide is where the Patriots really have to be concerned because I'll give you Amari Cooper's baseline stats here in a second, but the stuff you need to know is that he's been among the best wide receivers against man coverage in the NFL here so far. And more than that, he just leads the Browns across the table uh, in every single category. 27 catches, 304 yards, and three touchdowns. So, Cooper's the big one. You're also looking at David Njoku, who's a little bit of a mismatch at tight end. But frankly, the way Kyle Duggar has been strapping himself to TJ Hawkinson and then for stretches Pat Fryermuth back in week two at Pittsburgh, I wouldn't be as concerned with him. Donovan Peoples-Jones is also in you know the plus 20 targets, but it's really Cooper, Njoku, and Peoples-Jones. And of those three, the way the Patriots are likely to play defense, obviously keep an eye on Amari Cooper. Um, defensively, I mentioned 30th in defense. They are dead last. This is the third straight opponent the Patriots are going to face that ranks dead last in run defense ahead of their games. You know, some big names, Miles Garrett on the end, he's banged up and what was a very unfortunate, uh, but in some ways very lucky one car uh, accident. He endured a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it looks like he's going to play. 
They only have six turnovers. I, I was curious to hear Belichick call them very disruptive defense uh, because they're averaging, of course, then just about one per game. They've got some sloppy tackling, ranked second worst according to pro football focus. But again, you at least have the talent there. So it seems like a poorly coached defense doesn't blitz a whole lot, um, which is fine when you've got Miles Garrett, Jadavian Clowney, but guys like Denzel Ward are there. Ronnie Harrison's a good player at safety. John Johnson, um, the third is there. You've got second round picks and JOK and linebacker. So it's a very fast defense and they try to use that speed to make up for some of their problems. But at the other times, it creates some of their issues over pursuing again, bad tackling, not stop to kind of break down and face up, head up and make the tackle. So they're dead worst against the run again, very fast defense. They're bottom 10 and pressure rate, which feels weird for a miles Garrett defense. Obviously part of the injury factors into that. I mentioned Clowney, you know, you could talk about all these, you know, two dual pass rushing edge guys. Clowney for a while now has really been a better run defender um, than a one-on-one -on -one pass rusher, incredibly sturdy on the edge. Like there's a reason in addition to him wanting one year contracts to maximize his year to year value, that he's not super coveted. Like he bounces around to Tennessee, obviously he's in Cleveland now, long time in Houston before that Seattle. And it, it's really, that's where his strength is, which of course sounds weird because again, the Browns are dead last against the run out wide. I mentioned Denzel Ward, Pro Bowl kid, again, former top 10 pick. He has a concussion, unclear if he'll play, but if he does, that is a big issue because I just don't think you want even Mac Jones really looking a whole lot in his direction uh, because of how talented sound and actually disruptive uh, he is. So with all this information here, Browns are very talented, very well coached on offense, defense leaves some to be desired, but can still create problems. And we could have the Bailey's happy conversation. I think we're all on the same page, even if you're like me, where he has way far exceeded expectations Hats off and kudos to him. I think the Patriots are going to manage him very similarly in Cleveland, like we saw against Detroit. And I know the folks at YouTube want me to start drawing up some of the things, um, you know, or in the YouTube comments, I should say, our, our listeners and viewers on YouTube that I'm describing in these film review pods, working on it. But as for now, just know that the Patriots are dressing up the same eight to 10, maybe 12 plays with different formations and motions to keep it simple for Bailey Zappi but make it look complicated for the defense. I think you're going to see a lot of that in addition to a ton of reminder of Stevenson. It is Stevenson, baby. We have been telling you since July to get on the Stevenson bandwagon and all of that is going to come to fruition. How successful they are in that now on the road, uh, probably unable to protect Bailey Zappi as well as they did against Detroit when he was only pressured just twice. I don't know. So I'm going to say it again. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. I just think you have to bake in about a turnover and a half, maybe two, into this experience with a fourth round rookie going on the road for the first time, probably making a second star um, into this game. Now, if it's Mac Jones, honestly, I would have the same expectation because they're going to want to push the ball down the field a little bit more. And he's going to be a sitting duck in the pocket makes him more likely to strip sack. So just expect a little aggression offense. I still feel good about this game. If you're the Patriots, because I'm reviewing my own film review from last year, again, 45 to seven, the whole intro is just about, the Patriots are back and not in a way that they're Super Bowl contenders, but they can problem solve because the way they scheme Cleveland up, the way they, how physical they were on defense and in the running game, it was just, there's nothing you can do about them. They were the better team. They were more prepared. And I think that's going to carry over enough to put them in a good position, but we'll get to uh, two keys and then one extra point at the end for the matchups. This distills pretty clearly to me. I mentioned Amari Cooper. He's going to see a lot of Jalen Mills or Jack Jones. Jack Jones has been a lot of fun, back-to-back -back picks. He's in the conversation for defensive rookie in the year, as much as people talk about that in week six. Um, but like any rookie, he's going to have some boomer bust plays. So how does Cooper handle a fourth-round rookie in Jack Jones, or does he see more of Jalen Mills? They're man-to-man -man coverage, and I would expect some doubles or at least some, some sort of shade with the safety over to his side on third downs. How does that go? Because that will dictate a lot of how Jacoby Brissett does overall as a quarterback second one miles garrett versus trent brown or isaiah win trent brown was back finally from injury last year when they faced each other he all but erased him garrett was not heard from at all not a hurry not a quarterback hit certainly not a sack after the patriots opening drive i think they feel very good about their plan for him here which includes some misdirection of the running game but isaiah win seven penalties a bunch of sacks hurries you you worry about that matchup but leave it a little bit even if garrett is not 100 percent Last one, Juwan Bentley. I mean, you could pick Devon Godshall, Lawrence Guy, maybe if he comes back. But Juwan Bentley is on the field to stop the run. And how well he can wrap up or meet Nick Chubb in the backfield is going to be, in my mind, the number one 
uh, factor in how well the Patriots control Nick Chubb in that running game. It's going to take more than him and Bentley and Guy, even just the three of them. You need strong edges from Judon, Jennings when he's playing on early downs, Dietrich Wise is playing great all around. But I just, if you're going to get a negative play against Chubb, which kind of takes him out on that on second and 12, the Browns are then more likely to throw the ball and not give it to their best player. That's going to be Juwan Bentley shooting the right gap and diagnosing the play correctly. And if he doesn't, you know, the Browns get to play in their terms. And just like last week, what we talked about setting the term of engagement, the first half is going to be so key here because if the Patriots put this game on Jacoby Brissett, just like the Browns are going to try to do to Bailey Zappi, you have the upper hand. You get to play the game you want to play, which is, of course, pretty safely given the state of your quarterback position. So that's it. All right, here comes Ty Dunn, Bill Belichick stories, Gronk stuff, background on Ben Coates. This is all around pod for everyone by the book. Next week, the blood and guts, how tight and save football. Without further ado, Ty Dunn of Go Long. Ty Dunn of Go Long in the author of the upcoming book, The Blood and Guts, How Tight Ends Save Football. Also high on my personal power rankings of reading his stories and going, God damn it, because of how well he <laughs> writes, long form, single lines, just well-rounded storyteller. Uh, thanks for coming on the pod, man. Oh, man. Well, I'm, I'm flattered. That's very nice of you. But uh, you, you do one hell of a job yourself, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. And it was great seeing you in Pittsburgh there. You know, we caught up a little bit. Unfortunately, we weren't able to, to get that beer, but we're going to make it happen on the road at some point this season. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like they say, the early part of the season, just an extension of the preseason. So we're working up to playoff beers is where we're at. That's right. Down the line. And you got the interview. You can tell you're on the circuit now response of just flattery right away put me at ease just put butter everyone up like you're 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 seasoned here baby you're in the middle of this book tour huh i like the yukon stuff behind you i just had all these flashbacks to like jake voskel and rip hamilton and more who's the point guard clean alamine <laughs> yeah yeah no i like that yukon team was fun uh god who ricky was there a guy named ricky moore maybe defensive yep. stopper at guard yeah that team that beat duke uh that was fun. I mean, I went to Syracuse, and there, there were some battles there. Uh, and, and the old Big East, when men were men, the real Big East, uh, there, there, there were some good games. We need another book soon, How the Big East Saved Basketball, at least temporarily, because uh, we're back, but you guys bailed early. Anyway, that's the time for another story. I want to lead off just 30 seconds, because I know you've also gotten good at this. Um, 30 to 60 seconds, give me a tease or an explainer of just how exactly tight ends save football. Tight end save football because until you just stick flags in belts or make this two hand touch, you still got to block. You still have to tackle. And you know, that happens in the trenches, every play for 60, 70, 80, sometimes 90 plays in a game. And you know, linemen are, are hitting each other every play, but tight ends are just a hell of a lot more fun. I mean, the tight ends are doing that stuff and they get to go out and catch a pass and celebrate and show their personality and just bring that authenticity to the sport so we can relate to the tight end in, in countless ways. I'm sure we'll get into, uh, but yeah, I think that's it. I think that the NFL is constantly um, overly sanitizing their product, right. And in, mm -hmm. in the name of quote unquote safety, you know, making a unsafe game safe. I just, it, it seems like an oxymoron. It seems like it doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, do we want players maiming each other out there and just, taking each other's heads off and we don't want concussed players laying all over the field. I'm, I'm not a Neanderthal, but I think when you see it, you know it. And the overcorrection has been gross. I mean, to put it mildly. So thank God for guys like Ben Coates. Thank God for guys like Rob Gronkowski, Gronkowski specifically coming when he did in you know, the 2010s. That's really when we saw that overcorrection start to re reach some extremes. So um, Gronk was the player that we love to watch, right? I mean, that, he's entertaining. Uh, we, we, we can't take our eyes off of the car crash on the side of the highway. And he was a car crash, you know, several times through the course of an NFL Sunday. He was a train going through NFL defenses, particularly early prime Gronk. Like, you know, there's a game I, I still remember vividly. And this is before I started covering the team in 18. They're at Washington 2011. And it's just, preposterous the number of times he should have been down or guy gives up on a play and he is just full testosterone bull going down the field. And I, I like the way that he hit on that a, because Gronk 
was a lot of fun, but the position just encapsulates the sport, right? Like I've said to our listeners yeah. many times, it's the most involved position on the field besides quarterback. You're run blocking, you're pass blocking on occasion, you're running routes, you need to read coverages, you know, all the fundamentals that go into offense line play apply to tight end. Now, the fundamentals are not what you want to talk about with Gronk, who you just told me off air before we got started. You got to chat with for 90 minutes on the phone. So, A, before we get to the other Gronk questions, how was that? It was great. He was uh, he was Gronk, right? We, we talked about the, the, the manner in which he partied and, you know, his go-to dance moves. And when he's got a few drinks in him, uh, how, how his shoulders shimmy, his hips swivel. And, you know, not exactly Michael Jackson out there. But like you said, you know, Partying like he did, it uh, kept him in shape. He, he, it's not like he's pounding 15 beers like we might and you know, sitting on a bar stool. He's got his vodka water. He's dancing with Waka Flocka Flame. He's wrestling with Mojo Raleigh. Like, he, it's a workout. It's a workout. And guess what? When he feels guilty that morning after, he's doing an insanity workout in P90X with his brother. So, <laughs> which is kind of like he looked up to Jeremy Shockey. And that's something Jeremy Shockey would do. He would just like pound out a hundred pushups or whatever in the middle of the night when he's drunk because he just felt guilty. It's, it's kind of the parallels between those two players kind of blew my mind. Uh, but yes, in conversation, you, you see that Gronk, you feel that Gronk. Um, it, it's awesome. But same time, I think that, um, you know, he's, he's a lot smarter than maybe I expected than a lot of people expect. This is somebody who had really good grades in school, this is somebody who, you know, take his word for it, has not spent a penny of his contract money on anything. He's lived off endorsements. Julian Edelman said how he's just so good with numbers. Um, I'm not saying like it was all a facade, the Yo Soy Fiesta and, and all of that, but I, I think that's probably what stood out too is in conversation is you know, I, I think that there's, a, a, you know, definitely a football smart tight end here that could see the same thing Tom Brady was seeing. And that's a huge reason why he lasted as long as he did. And let's face it, we probably haven't seen the last of them. I, I, this is just me talking. It's a gut feeling. I, I think that Gronk is going to be out there on the field. So you you talking this year? Hey, if Tampa Bay is in the hunt, and let's face it, the NFC is a, it's a cluster you-know-what. So Tom Brady is going to be right there like he always is, late November, early December. And if – but you have to assume there'll be injuries, right? To tight end, to receiver, like every team. And if he wants another weapon to join him, why wouldn't he just pick up the phone and call her? I mean, if, if Rob Gronkowski's own agent, Drew Rosenhaus, is immediately, like moments after the retirement announcement, telling everybody, well, you know, if Tom picks up the phone, he's going to listen. Um, yeah, I mean, because it, I want everybody to read the full chapter because it's. I think your takeaway is going to be this is – this is somebody who's been a glutton for punishment his entire life. Back to growing up in Buffalo, New York. You know, we actually kind of came up at the same time. Granted, I'm at Class D Ellicottville. He's at like Class A in Williamsville. Much, much bigger school. Thank God we didn't play against each other because I wouldn't be sitting here talking yet. I'd be, you know, flattened on Route 219 or something. Ever since he was little, his brothers have just been beating the shit out of him. I mean, and he's been beating the shit out of his brothers. Many sticks bashing into the bubble hockey super checks machine breaking that oh there go thousands of dollars up in smoke so it was uh, it was a different childhood um my point being like he's always needed to get hit he's always needed to deliver hits i think he likes getting hit more than he actually likes you know inflicting pain he's proud of getting up from that earl thomas hit you know that harpoon to the chest you know that lit him up and actually forced him to miss time and if you're like that and you still have some game left and you took a little time off. Look, remember he came out of retirement before. Why not come out of this semi-retirement to chase another ring and have some fun and, and, you know, laugh with Tom Brady. Yeah. Well, by the way, Tom Brady, he's going through some shit himself, as he put with Giselle. Um, they could have some fun. I could see it. December, January, the boys back in town chasing a ring. Yeah, look, I don't doubt it. I, I remember saying that as soon as he uh, retired, which, of course, he had the year delay. We can go through all of that. But I, I want to go more into the book because it's, I, I like that you mentioned that he's smarter than people realize because, you know, I just mentioned it's the most involved position of the offense for all the things you need to know and then execute. Like, that takes smarts, and you don't get on the field, let alone for Tom Brady, but for Bill Belichick 
and play there as long as he did. Obviously, the physical talent is, is putting them there in the first place. But you don't stay unless you know what you're doing. So how did that come across to you in your conversation and in any sort of your research about, like, Gronk at least is, is like a genius meathead, but, yeah. but maybe we should put the meathead first, like meathead genius. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean he is – the first person to admit, I think his family would say the same, like, yeah, he's a meathead. Like, but that does, just because you're a meathead, it doesn't mean you're a dummy. I mean, he's practicing every route with Tom Brady. He's you know, breaking it down. You know, you know what was really fascinating, Andrew, is, you know, Dallas Clark, getting to know him really well. And I talked to Peyton Manning about this. When they would run routes together, it was on the practice field, you know, working on one specific route. Like, today we're going to work on a five or a seven or – whatever they wanted to work on. And they'd run that route 20 to 25 times to an inch, right? And, and, and constantly just you know, honing and sharpening and getting it down right to exactly where Peyton Manning wants it to be. Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski did that. You know, they would work on several different routes. And, you know, I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but they had the same connection where the two of them are out on the field working after practice and, just pounding away at multiple routes again and again and again and again. And I think that it got to the point where they could see the same thing out there. Rob knew where he needed to be. Tom Brady knew where he wanted Rob. And there, that, that, that connection was special. And in a weird way, I think that Jimmy Graham, there's a, there's a, a sense that he not, not regret, right? Because he's fighting for the tight end position and all these tight ends are so underpaid and he's trying to prove that he's a wide receiver He's used like a wide receiver. He should be paid way more than the tight ends are paid. And that eventually kind of led to Jimmy Graham ended up in Seattle. But I think that part of Jimmy Graham absolutely wishes he was able to stick with Drew Brees to kind of develop that same relationship that Dallas Clark had with Peyton Manning, that Rob Gronkowski had with Tom Brady. Um, the, 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 the relationship between the quarterback and the tight end is, is, is kind of like a subplot to the book. Like you go, go way back in time to – Dan Fouts and Kellen Winslow. I mean, they would just scream at each other. Like they, <laughs> once in a while, you'll see like a clip pop up on NFL films. And it's just like, everything's got to get bleeped out. Like Kellen Winslow was a cranky, cranky dude who, if he, if he didn't get what he wanted on the field, whether it's a call or the ball or whatever, he'd let the ref or Fouts or Corey, I'll know about it. And Fouts would give it right back to him. He'd scream right back at him. It was like this, this cranky kind of relationship, but I mean, Fouts loved it. He liked that ego in Kellen Winslow. Uh, and I think that's what you'll see is like each chapter, the quarterback will pop up Drew Bledsoe. He went to Ben Coates as his security blanket early in his career a lot. Um, that was a pretty cool relationship in its own right, as I'm sure your listeners are well aware, right? We're all, we're all about that 90s nostalgia. Yeah, I mean, the 90s nostalgia is hitting me hard right now at baseball playoffs. And all I want to talk about is guys like Aaron Harang or Carlos Baerga. Um, but I, we're going to stick with Ron Mankowski really quickly. Then go yes, ahead and coach. yes. It, yeah, don't, don't let me take you off path, man. I, I'll, I'll get rambling on these guys. Don't, don't <laughs> let me do that. Uh, not necessarily the wildest story. Maybe not the most impressive feat in terms of lifting or being on the field, which we've all seen, we've all heard, we know yeah. the clips. What was just your favorite Gronk anecdote that just hit you and made you smile the longest as you're doing all this research? <laughs> There's a lot, but the first, about the, the first half of the chapter, I want to say maybe like 5,000 words or so it's all the rise of Gronk and what led to that scene in the green room where he's surrounded by his family and they're going nuts and he puts the helmet on and they're chanting Gronk, 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 everything that led to that. And growing up in Buffalo, like he was the instigator, but the story is in Western New York, growing up in Western New York, uh, maybe this is the case elsewhere. I think, I think it's specific to Buffalo though. There was um, a man named, a man named father Baker, um, uh, back a Roman Catholic priest, uh, took in orphans and he died in the thirties. So, you know, a hundred years ago almost, but like the, the saying is, you know, if you keep acting like this, we're going to ship you away to Father Baker. Like you're going to go stay with Father Baker. We're going to we're going to we're going to send you off. So in the Gronk household, that was a common threat. And one day, you know, when Rob's acting up, Cordy says he's Cordy told him to pack your stuff up. We're going to Father Baker's. Rob just starts packing his stuff up. <laughs> there goes the jock strap. There goes the baseball glove. His clothes. 
everything. They they get in the car. His dad's going along with it. They get the, they're going to they're go to Father Baker's, and Rob's waving everybody on the street and say, "Oh, I'll be gone for a little bit." This is on Sheridan Drive, you know, well known uh, road to Western New York. Oh, so I'll be back soon. I won't be gone long. And they they pull up. They pull up. You know, this place doesn't exist. Obviously, Gordy finds a building that can kind of serve as the home of Father Baker, like this abandoned, like, I don't know what it was. It was like a warehouse. And they pull up. Rob, you know, he has his stuff. All right, it's t- time to go. You won't, you won't listen to your mom. It's over. Get out of here. We'll get, get, give, he'll give me a call when you're all better. And <laughs> Rob starts freezing up. Gordy walks around to the passenger side. He's like, hey, Rob, it's time to go. Let's go. You got to go. And then Rob. Bob just completely breaks down. He's crying and he's crying and he's crying. And he, he promises dad, I'll behave. I'll behave. I promise. I promise. And at one point, like his dad's pulling Rob and Rob's hands are on the steering wheel. He's completely horizontal as Gordy's pulling him. And finally he promises that he will be better. That he'll just, he'll change his ways. He'll listen to mom and dad. He'll start behaving. They get in the car, they drive home and, uh, yeah, nothing changes. Rob's why, why is it so easy to just imagine that same scene, but instead of Gordy, it's Belichick just trying to try? To- <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I can, I, I can see that. Yeah, you can see Bill doing doing that number with Rob. Yeah, like especially right after the monster truck press conference, right at Gillette, you know, off season. What are you doing? And he just won't talk about anything about football. And then you know they want to trade him. And he threatens to cancel that. It was uh, it was it was funny too. I mean, I I love that story because everything has to go back to family, right? Like it's not just yeah. Rob. I mean, his name is Rob, but it comes from Garkowski, which is a name he shares with all of his meathead brothers and meathead father and the mom who's somehow keeping that all together and whom he shouts out, you know, all the time, even at the Super Bowl, like, I'm just going to go hang out with my mom, because that's what formed him and made him him before he, you know, comes into England, and he just gets to embody all of that at once. Um, And look, you know, we talk about how smart he is, and and on this, and go to Ben Coates, you know, people, it's easy to forget that when he came out of retirement, like we were just talking about, he outmaneuvered the Patriots and got his exact way to go to Tampa Bay. Like the only way he was going to come out of retirement was if he got traded there. And the only way they were going to get any sort of compensation, um, you know, is if they, if that followed through and that happened. And so he would come back, but he wasn't going to play for them because they still had his rights one year left in that contract. And uh, he got to play football again and not go back to the Patriot way, which had worn him down over all those years. I think that Rob really did need that year off to reset mind, body, everything soul and yeah he 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 was in a bad place Phys- physically more than anything was the sense i think he had mentally for sure like belichick will grind you down like that there is something to that he was ready to move on uh and in time like like tom brady ra- ra- all these expatriates when when it all it ends poorly for all of them in new england but over time they they learn to appreciate it i mean i just hung out with Stephon gilmore uh, for a story to go along and everybody out there knows how poorly that ended. And he didn't like how Bill Belichick and the training staff dealt with his injury. They thought he was rushing him back, lifting weights, running too much and um, let, let them know. But he, I mean, less than a year later in our conversation, he's going out of his way to praise Bill Belichick for making him the cornerback or helping him become the cornerback that he is today, which he hopes is the hall of fame corner. The Colts are winless without Stephon Gilmore. He yeah. won both games, so he can still he can still ball. So it, you know it's gonna get to that point for everybody. But yeah, physically the hit that the collisions that he you know in, inflicted, you know absorbed it, it, it boggles the mind. I mean, from his rookie year when he's crack back blocking on Kyle Vandenbosch and essentially breaking the dude's neck to the end when he's taking that shot from Earl Thomas and he's missing time. I mean, you name an injury, Rob Gronkowski has had it. God knows how many concussions. So he just needed a year to kind of get his wits about him, um, recalibrate. And he loves, I mean, I think he just genuinely loves football. That's what's so cool about Rob Gronkowski. Like he, you know, maybe it's as simple as that. Like maybe he does play again just because he loves it. It's fun. You know, he, he, he does it for the right reasons. He's, he's out there like laughing during the, during the game. He did it cool in college and pro. Julian Edelman said you, you can hear him cackling you can hear him laugh it's the same thing with George Kittle 
Um, <laughs> I, and that just tells you, like, he, he's somebody who need, who needs it, and he likes getting hit. We'll see. You know, I think what would keep it in, him in retirement, though, he's got other interests. Like, he wants to be an actor. I think we're going to see him in the movies. Um, he Before he returned to Tampa, uh, his family had a deal in place with Vince McMahon and the WWE. I'm not sure exactly like what the deal was and what everybody would have been doing, but they were going to go like all out with the wrestling stuff. And then Rob said he wanted to keep playing football. So, you know, he's doing a lot right now. He's involved with a lot of different things. Um, but here we are, we're, we're sitting in whatever it is, October 13th. Now let's check back in on uh, November 22nd, 23rd, early December when his body's feeling pretty fresh. And uh, Tom Brady plays his headphones. Yeah, Thanksgiving, as we know up here in New England, that's when real football starts anyway. And that's when Rob can just cackle his way all the way back to the playoffs because that seems to be where the Bucks are going. But let's uh, let's go back in time first. Uh, ben Coach, original 87 tight end, two-time All-Pro, five-time Pro Bowler, you know, plays the entirety of the 90s with the Patriots, then goes to Baltimore. I forgot, started nine games for that Super Bowl winning team, the Ravens, their first title. Um, played a Super Bowl, obviously, in New England. You know, beyond the stats, beyond the footage and the highlights, like why is it, if you agree with me at all, that like made Ben Coates so good during that stretch of the time where you had a couple more tight ends, but it wasn't like we look at them now, particularly thanks to fantasy football, as just these monster producers. You're right. I mean, I think at, at that time through the 90s, you did have Shannon Sharp, and we, we had a Shannon Sharp chapter, and he, he was fun as hell. I mean, what he did – for just general camaraderie in the sport is special. It, 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 the stories there will, you know, will crack you up. Um, and then Tony Gonzalez at the end of the decade, he is the one who really evolves the position, takes it this unforeseen direction. But then right in the middle, you got Ben Coates in the nineties doing everything. I mean, he is taking on Reggie White one-on-one -on -one in the Super Bowl, And, when he wasn't and New England was down by a couple touchdowns and Coates is running routes to try to catch up. That's when Reggie White had his three sacks. He's one-on-one -on -one against Bruce Smith twice a year in, in the old AFC East. He blocked Lawrence Taylor. I mean, these are like three of the most fearsome players to ever play. Like the minister of defense, right? Uh, the dude who does bad, bad things. And, you know, LT, all he did was snap a dude's leg and a half. So, Ben Coates is a tight end. He, as he says, no backside block. We're talking, you know, the, the ball, Curtis Martin is running right behind me, and I got to take on Bruce Smith. I talked to Curtis Martin, Drew Bledsoe as well, and they, they go out of their way to say, this guy's a Hall of Famer because, yeah, I mean, he had the receiving numbers. You know, when he retired, only like three players had more yards at the position than him, and they're on the Hall of Fame. But he also was this blocker. And I, I think that what made him different, what made him special is he missed two games. He missed one game with a high ankle sprain, um, you know, keeps guys out for months. The other game he missed was because his, his mother died. That's it. I mean, he played through so much. Curtis Martin told the story of like, you know, Curtis Martin missed a lot of games uh, at Pitt with injuries. Remember when he came out of college, there were dur durability concerns with Curtis Martin. And uh, he said it would really help him become the durable player in the pros right? That longevity is the reason he's in the Hall of Fame as, at running back is seeing a guy like Ben Coates sprain his ankle, see that foot just completely swell, blow up. You know, it's, it's so big. He, he's got to walk around the facility barefoot. Seeing Sam Gash, the fullback, break his toe. The toe is straight, it is straight up in the air so he cuts a hole in the cleat so the toe can fit through and he keeps practicing. Curtis Martin's looking at this like, yeah, all right, I've got this injury. I'm, I'm going to keep playing. Um, that that's a Ben Coates effect. This is somebody who, I mean, I could, we could spend the whole hour talking about the pain he played through. I mean, there's like one, one time his helmet got shifted and he, he cut his head and he just started bleeding like a little metal piece from his helmet, just sliced them open. Um, you know, on the old, he's playing on the old Astro turf, the branding his fraternity branding from college that cut open and he needed to stitch that up. I mean, the, and these are the little things, you know, mangled fingers, um, busting up a thumb and playing with a cast on um, the high ankle sprains. He's, every, you know, every, everything. His, his earlobe, I think I wrote this one down because I was going to forget it. Yeah, his earlobe nearly ripped off. That was the one for the helmet spinning around. Um, the, oh, and his elbows. Yeah, you can see he's got like pointy elbows from the bursitis. 
and he, he feels it today. I mean, it's hard for him to get around the house. Uh, when we were talking, he wasn't really driving himself and he's the first to say, I mean, big picture, different conversation. He's the first to say he, he would do that all over again because how much he loved the sport, what it did for him, what it did for his family. But yeah, back to your question. I really think what made him different is he, he was just old school country tough. I mean, he, he would play through anything and it's all rooted in his upbringing. It's rooted in building roofs with his dad. It's rooted in being the son of a world war two veteran. His brothers went off to fight in the middle East. This is as tough as SOB as you're going to find in pro football history. So, you know, I think part of the legacy, right, is is local. You know, he got to be a big enough star, two-time All-Pro, speaks for itself, but also not someone who's kind of surefire, shoe and Hall of Famer that people would know coast to coast, right? Like that's Ben Coates. So what do you see as his legacy taking into account the stuff that's publicly known and the stuff you've learned that's a little bit more private versus maybe what it should be in light of how difficult that position is, let alone through playing, I think you listed, you know, 37 different injuries over a 10, 11-year career. Right, and he he wouldn't take any cortisone shots. He'd see teammates getting that needle, and he's like, "Yeah, I don't want that thing wiggling around and squirting blood everywhere." He was kind of grossed out by it, so he didn't really, you know, mask the pain as much as other players. Um, and that's got to account for something. I, I think that the fact that he played such a big part in the reawakening of the of the franchise it's it's so easy. And, and we when we all look back at the Patriots, I think. By and large, our kids and our kids' kids, they're going to they're gonna go back to 2000. And Mo Lewis lighting up Drew Bledsoe, Tom Brady stepping in, Bill Belichick, all the Super Bowls, all the rings. But we cannot forget where this franchise was a decade prior. And we, I talked about this with Ben Coates in the book. I'm just – I mean, how, how dire the situation was for the franchise. The, the threat of them leaving the, the areas, everybody knows there, was, was so real. Uh, they were cheap. You know, pre-Bob Crabb, they were – cheaper than shit. I mean, it would just leak in their facility. The indoor bubble wasn't even a hundred yards. Um, Drew Bledsoe was telling me how you, you had to like sign off for socks. Like guys would come from colleges, in the SEC from better facilities and better equipment than with <laughs> they're getting at the pros in new England. Uh, but what made Ben Coates different was you know, where he came from. I mean, Oh, I, I get this sign out for socks and cleats. That's awesome. Oh my God. Like just he from, from age seven to 20, all he did was build roofs with his dad. I mean, he, and some of these roofs were like that on a slant where they'd have to nail in a board just to stay balanced. And he's throwing shingles on his, over his shoulder and he's up and he's down and uh, you know, you're ripping off different layers. You know, sometimes you got to rip, you got to rip the old roof off before you can put the new one on. By the way, it's 90 degrees. It's uh, It was a different life. He was built for it. I think, you know, it, it's weird because the numbers are there. So the winning is there. Um, there is a legacy to consider. I guess we don't talk about him enough nationally because he's not on TV. He's not in the media. You don't give a, you don't give a shit about any of that. Like, he's not going to shill. He's not going to have Hall of Fame campaigns led by, you know, one of his daughters or his sons. and you know, go on this all out Twitter blitz to try to bang everybody over the head. This is how special I was. Like he, he kind of poked fun at Drew Pierce and he's like, yeah, I am not going to be crying like this guy over here, basically. Um, that's Wait, just so not what, Ben what Coates. And, you know, I, you visited him in North Carolina. Like what is Ben Coates up to nowadays? Well, when he was done playing, he, he coached for a while, you know, in, in the pros and college, small colleges, but eventually like all the, all the sitting and then all the standing, it just it hurt his back so much where he just couldn't do it physically. Um, right now, I think he's just enjoying being a dad. He's, he's got a lot of kids. He's trying to get to their events. Um, I, I haven't talked to him, so we got together. That, that was the very first uh, tight end I hung out with for this book, and that was in the first week of September. So it's been over a year. I'm hopeful, you know, from afar, it, it looks like he's doing better physically than he, than he was that day. Um, and like I said, he, he, he loved it. Uh, he would do it again. And he's proud. I think cause he's, he's proud of that. He left it all on the field and, you know, we can't relate to it. All of us might think that's nuts. Like, dude, you've, you've got the rest of your life to live decades to live. What, how, how could that be worth it? But that's the power of football. I just think it, it does so much good for you intrins intrinsically inside and it makes you who you are as a person. 
in addition to how we can set up generations of your family that all of these, all of these tight ends, keeping the position alive, keeping the sport alive, would say the same thing pretty much. There, there's not going to be many that say, oh, it wasn't worth it. I didn't know what I signed up for. I, I take it all back. No, like they're, 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 they're proud of the fact that they left it all on the field like Ben Coates did. Yeah. Do you know if he's um, keeping up on the team much? Does he, does he follow us to watch from, from down in North Carolina? I don't think, I don't think so. Not a lot. I mean, a little bit, you know, I think he's, he's on top of it, but um, what was another, what's kind of cool about Ben Coates. He's not, he's not one to revel in the past. Like in his house, he's got one little Patriots uh, mini helmet in the, in his living room. Like right when you walk in, it's like kind of near the living room. Uh, beyond that, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have his jerseys up on walls and trophies and game balls. It's just it's like all that stuff is just kind of stashed away. Like he doesn't, doesn't really want to live in the past. I, I'm, I'm sure he's up on the Patriots to an extent and, and does care, but he's not like living and dying on his past and, and living and dying on how the team's doing today, I don't think. Yeah, and maybe I'm forgetting something, but again, now my fifth season covering the team, I, I just – can't remember a time he's up or been honored for a day like you know there's obviously some commemorations in the Patriots Hall of Fame that's right next to the stadium um, but beyond that it kind of fits with what I would assume is the low-key kind of profiles a guy who left it all out there there's nothing yeah. more to add and he's just kind of leaving it in the past which is admirable I, I think it's so refreshing not, you know nothing against guys that have the jersey up on the wall I mean and are, and are proud of their accomplishments but there is something kind of cool about Man, like I, I did it for the right reasons. I did it for my teammates out on the field and just the, the purity of competition and, you know, catching a ball, running down the field, smashing you, running you over, going back for the next play, lining up against the defensive end, taking them head on. Um, they, they know what that that's and he did it all for a Super Bowl ring and he didn't win against the Green Bay, but damn it, they, they, they won the Baltimore Ravens in 2000 and Ben Coates. Yeah. He didn't have, didn't have great numbers on that team. Nobody probably even remembers him as a Raven, but well, I tell no you who does, Jamal Lewis that Ravens team period. So it's, it's not even, a yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. But Jamal Lewis as a, you know, as a young player, you know, he, he ran for a thousand yards and you know, a lot of that was behind Ben Coates and he was the one blocking Michael Strahan in that Super Bowl. So when they won that Super Bowl, he just turned that hat backwards and, and soaked it in. I think that that was kind of like that moment where, yes, it was all worth it for this. Between Gronk and Ben Coates, there's a, you know a number of tight ends in between there. Talk about 2000 to 2010 when Gronk gets drafted. Two of them, Bill Belichick takes in the first round in his first four years. Daniel Graham in 2002, Ben Watson uh, in, in 2004 after Vince Wilfork, which neither of them probably live up to first round billing. But it shows an investment that Belichick has in that position to care for it, or a realization that this is going to, again, tie my offense together. We're going to play through this. Gronker and Hernandez later, we talked about Hunter Henry and John Smith when they got here. That's how he tried to reload then and now around Gronk's time. So when you're doing research for the book, I heard you tell my guy, Phil Perry, that like Belichick just kept coming up and coming up and coming up. Clearly, he cares a ton about the position. I just laid that out. How else was he coming up throughout this whole process, even with guys not related to the Patriots franchise? Take it back even further. Um, when he's with Cleveland and he's facing Ben Coates and he, he's making sure that like Pepper Johnson and he's getting two, three different bodies on Coates, just hitting them off the line. And he knew how important that player was back then. And you know, it, it, I mean, it, it came up several times. I'm trying to think back. Kirk Ferentz, right? The Iowa yeah. coach is a Cleveland Browns, offensive line coach under Bill Belichick. And he can remember ahead of like a random 1995 game against the green Bay Packers. He said, oh, nothing really rattled Bill Belichick as, as a head coach. But before that game, like he was a little, you know, uh, uneasy about facing the Packers because they had Mark Chamura and Keith Jackson. Like they had this two tight end set, you know, the green Bay picked up Keith Jackson, you know, or tail end of his prime there with, with the Eagles, but he, you know, he can still make some plays and, and Mark Chamura was coming on and Bill Belichick didn't they really know how, how do I defend these two dynamic tight ends? So he knew back then as a defensive coach, how tough it is to defend you know, two versatile tight ends who can both block. It can both run routes and both catch balls. So of course, yeah, he's going to go find Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez and, and try to scheme things up in ways 
um, that nobody had really done to that extent before. Yeah. Anything else? Any other tidbits that were Belichick related? I mean, we can go, obviously go back to Mark Bavaro. Yeah. Know, oh, right? yeah. That's a huge influence there. Like Bill brings him up. I don't think we've hit our quota yet of like two or three Bavaro references or visits at camp. What about uh, back in those days? You know what? Yeah, he obviously, you know, he's he's around for all of that. But here's a, a little uh, story that your listeners may enjoy. Uh, if you want to pick up the book, Amazon, wherever you get your books. I cannot thank everybody enough for for pre-order. And it's just awesome to see um, all the Patriot fans wanting to get some blood and guts. And I've been hearing from you on Twitter. It's so cool. But Jimmy Graham, right? I'll just say this. Bill Belichick and the Patriots knew Jimmy Graham had – major tight end potential before anybody else in the NFL. So Jimmy Graham has his basketball career at the University of Miami, he dunks a bunch, blocks a bunch of shots, um, athletic in the ACC, running up and down the court. And he's trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what he's going to do when his basketball career is over. Uh, he thought about the Navy SEALs. Uh, he thought about you know, putting his degree to use. He was unbelievably bright. He thought about the NBA. He had some tryout, uh, tryout up could have played overseas you know he said that one team offered him like a half a million bucks and then he heard from the Patriots you know this is before he played a down of football at Miami and uh the Patriots wanted to work him out they did work him out Matt Patricia actually led the workout down in Miami and they they saw potential in Jimmy Graham at the tight end position and according to Jimmy Graham offered him a practice squad spot like hey we want you basically to come in develop and turn into something down the road. Jimmy Graham was flattered. Obviously, he thought long and hard about it, but he ended up returning, staying at school, I should say, and flipping on over to the football team as a, you know, as a grad. Uh, I forget what the exact title was. Greg Paulus did the same thing uh, when he played quarterback at Syracuse. With that extra year eligibility, you could, change, you could change your sport. And so that's what Jimmy Graham did. Didn't really catch a lot of passes, but there were a few plays – in the red zone, caught some touchdowns, showed his NFL potential, and obviously it takes off from there. Uh, Sean Payton, the New Orleans Saints, and there's a whole other story with that 2010 draft. I mean, Belichick's involved, Parcells is involved, Sean Payton's involved. There's a lot of coaches, a lot of moving parts, and Belichick misses him in 2010. Gets Rob Gronkowski, also goes to Aaron Hernandez instead of Jimmy Graham, which a lot of counterfactuals to consider there. Yeah, as always, as there are with the draft, good and bad. But I, I love that because that tells you, you know, they were ahead of the curve in that instance. And you wonder how many swings they've taken on players, not only to hit like Jimmy Graham did, but maybe elsewhere that they look just for sports, you know, that maybe were beyond basketball. I mean, they found Gunnar Osheski, who I write, you know, one of my longer features about back in Mass Live, who's a D2 corner, flip him to receiver. And now that dude is an all-pro punt returner. So it just shows in part – a, a lot of a major stories there and the big names, but like this, this operation goes as far and particularly for, you know, players who play positions like tight end that could do so much for the offense. If you take that kind of a big swing and connect. Um, so you, you've obviously do, uh, dove a whole lot into the past of football, the tight end position teams, players, hall of famers, all of this. If you had to guess with the way the position is trending now into the future, which to me seems getting smaller and smaller by the year, but we're going to have to hit, appointed diminishing returns with these like 230 pound F move tight ends. Does this bounce back to the bigger hybrid guys or where are we going? I still think it's so important for a tight end to do everything right. Because that unpredictability factor, if you can go out there and you can block and you can run a route and you can catch a pass and you can run the entire route tree. I mean, that, that that's the reason that Bill Belichick was, you know, a little uneasy before facing Mark Trevor and Keith Jackson, right? I mean, it's, it, it, you know, Kyle Pitts is going to like change the pay scale of the tight end position. This dude is special. You know, he, he's a wide receiver at the position. I think once he kind of beefs up, once he learns to block, he can maybe have that unpredictability factor and, and take this position into a new realm. But right now they're, they're not running power toward Kyle Pitts, right? You're running power toward George Kittle. You're not necessarily running power toward Travis Kelsey, I think that's what makes Kittle so special is, yeah, he might catch four passes for 30 yards in a game, but the 49ers also ran for 280. (laughs) So um, I I think that, yes, that that player is still coveted. It's just harder to find that player. You know, we have a Mark Bruner chapter in this book, 
And he was the throwback for the Pittsburgh Steelers, just block first, block always, taking pride and just being a road grader under Mike Larkey. Um, and now he's a scout for the Steelers. He's a college scout. He's looking for the next tight end. And he, he and Cecilia, it's harder to find that player that can block. But if you see a willingness, like they did in, in Friermuth, that you can develop it. And they, they're, they're kind of developing that complete tight end. So I, I think that more teams are going to have to go out of their way to, you know, identify and mold and bring along the complete tight end because it's just not going to fall out of thin air. Right, because it also ties into what you can do on a whole uh, conceptual level, right? Like depending on what your tight end can do, you can roll out the same personnel grouping with 12 or 21 and spread it out you know, and, and split them out wide and throw the ball. You can treat them like a six offensive tackle. If he's able to do that, if you have a tight end, like a Mike Kosicki, you know, who's you're basically in 11 personnel or 10, no matter, you know, if you have another tight end there or not, cause he's a big wide receiver, you're never running behind him. You're running split zone and having him go backwards. So I think you're right. It'll be interesting to see like, you know, the yeah. NBA, everyone can shoot threes, but guys are still seven foot tall. It's just, you're adding more skill set there. So maybe you know, you're, you're not getting smaller and everyone's playing small ball. You just have more aliens kind of on the field or on the court, but the way, I mean, look, look out when Kyle Pitts, you know, has some blocking to his game, right? Like when, you know, if, if, if Gusecki had some of that to his game, then Mike McDaniel's offense would just take off to another degree. I think that's why they're like, you know, those grumblings of them wanting to move on from Gusecki because he doesn't have that. Yeah. So that, that it's still so important to have that physicality. It just limits you as a play caller. All right, we'll get you out on this quick Patriots Browns preview. I know you have way too many other things to do than to watch Jacoby Brissett versus what's likely to be Bailey Zappi. But you've seen the Patriots once you're in the press box. Give me one Patriots key for going into Cleveland and beating the team with the best running game in the league and also the worst run defense. And then just one tight end related thought, our extra point, as you were, as we do kind of a three, two, one breakdown here. Well, Bill Belichick still values the position, right? He went out and he spent a lot of money on the tight end position last year. It hasn't exactly worked out. I'm not going to bail on the plan yet because I, I still think that's going to be a young quarterback's best friend. And you're going to see Bailey Zappi looking to his tight end early and often if he wants to get going as, as a passer in the NFL. So, yeah, keep an eye out for Hunter Henry. I I, I still think that's somebody that Bill Belichick's going to value and – as we know, it's way too early to write off this coach, this team. It's a long season, even in the AFC, which is much better than the NFC. Um, there, there could be something up Belichick's sleeve, and if there's something up there, it's tight end related. This game, I don't know. I, I, I'm out on the Browns. Like every, every time you want to think that they're a contender, and you know they can, they can win some games without Deshaun Watson, and they just do what they did last week and just crush the souls of their entire fan base. So yeah, this is New England's game to win. Uh, this is New England's figuring out their identity and the Browns. It's just, uh, they just disappoint you, man. Right. The, the old lovable Browns just going out and, you know, acquiring the quarterback they did at the price that they did. It's, uh, it's like, you know, here there's no Santa Claus. It's a, it's a little sad, isn't it? It's just that, that, that lovable franchise that just was always try hard and, oh man like anybody else, but only worse this off season. Right. Yeah. It's uh, and that's worse for their fans who then have to make the choice of giving up and stop rooting for them uh, when they've been through so much or continue to root for Deshaun Watson. Well, um, we're not going to end on that note. We're just going to thank you so much for your time. Uh, Austin Hooper, tight end, Brown's tight end, maybe a key defensively Patriots got to watch him in the red zone because the Patriots allowed a touchdown to Austin Hooper. Their only touchdown allowed in uh, last year's meeting, four to five to seven for the Patriots. So there, we turned it around. But um, the blood and guts, how tight end safe football, you can find it on Amazon pre-order now. It comes out Tuesday. Ty Dunn has been an outstanding writer for a long, long time. And now he gets to cement that as part of his legacy with his first book, man. I hope to have you back on soon. And we could do New York Times bestselling author, uh, Ty Dunn. Because then you get called that for life. It's Academy Award winner, you know? <laughs> that would be a beautiful thing. Hey, the only way we get there is if you're a legion of listeners and followers just go on amazon and and buy the blood and guts so thanks everybody appreciate you listening and and uh you know sinking your teeth into this book i think you're all gonna love it thanks man we'll see you for some uh, beers november december maybe january hell yeah man just tell me where and when we'll make it happen <laughs>